Florence Juma. And I was looking at Florence's bio again, and uh, she says, oh, titles are not important, but it's actually Reverend Dr. Uh, Florence Juma, which is very impressive. And uh, so wonderful to have you and your family here in Canada since 1998? Yes, November 1998. From Kenya. Uh, it's kind of sweet too that you list that uh, you have five daughters, two sons-in-law, and four grandchildren. Yes. You definitely look too young to have all that blessing. Uh, Thank I you. want to show a picture of your family. Uh, the year before yes. you came the to Canada, mm -hmm. this was actually taken in South Africa. In South Africa, yeah. Beautiful family. What brought you to our country? That's the biggest question. My husband, we were in South Africa, my husband was finishing his research in PhD. And uh, this is 95 when we arrived in South Africa, just the year after they gained independence and became democratic. Mm. The town or the university where we went to was, had been predominantly Africans. And that's the year they were transitioning to incorporate English language. So most of the material in this particular university were in Africans language. We didn't have a good, any knowledge actually of Africans language. And so he was having difficulty with this research. So his supervisor recommended an institute in Toronto called Institute for Christian Studies. It's a sister organization of the same university. Recommended that he go to that institute to finish his studies and that will help him because of the language factor. Wow. So my so husband came to Canada in 1997. And oh, ahead it was, of you. yes, it took one year to reunite as a family. Wow, the sacrifices. We that were in are South made. Africa and we had just settled there for a little over two years. And then we were thinking we'll now leave the maybe southmost of the hemisphere and go to the northmost of the hemisphere. So it took a bit of planning and then stopping in Kenya for five months just to visit again with family before leaving for Canada. Mm -hmm. How old were your children when you came? When we arrived in Canada, they were between the ages of 15 and five. There's 10 year span mm -hmm. between the eldest and the youngest. So my oldest was 15 and my youngest turned five two months after we arrived here. That's quite a group to get adjusted. A lot of, it is. for a mother's heart. It is, and in <laughs> fact, we came in two parts. My four daughters arrived in October and I arrived in November. That's because they arrived in September and I arrived in October because I think Air Canada, there was a strike at that time, just towards the end of summer, beginning of fall. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there was a backlog. And when we tried to get uh, all six of us in one flight, it was not possible. So they kept us on wait list and then there were four seats available. And because the older girls needed to be in school, that's why they came in September. And I waited with the youngest and another month before we teamed up all of us as a family. Tremendous yeah. challenges. Mm -hmm. you, you write about uh, a recipes for failure. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, you know, just even hearing this part of your story, uh, some of us are a little tense, thinking about the kinds of pressures mm -hmm. that you had to embrace to, to make life work for you and your family. And we must confess as, as a family, uh, it's just the community coming so strongly in support, in welcoming us, in helping us settle. It was the love and support of the community that we settled in. That's a small town Midwest Ontario, a small community. Yes, the challenges were always there, and just the difference cul in culture, the climate, mm -hmm. different country, it was all challenging. But the fact that there was a community almost prepared, ready to receive <laughs> this family, that's how it felt in the schools, in the churches, just in the community. There was so much, uh, you would think they were so prepared, they were ready to receive this community, just how they responded to our needs. To make you welcome. It made it, it helped our transition and made it really comfortable. Wonderful. Yeah. I said that you're working as a chaplain today in two hospitals. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a regular schedule or just I, when called? Um, both when called, but I also have regular schedules uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays. Mondays I spend uh, a bit a big part of my day at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital, but then I end the day at Grand River Hospital Oncology Ward, and then Wednesdays is ministry, and then I have specific days that I'm on call, either at Cambridge or Grand River. While reading these books, um, it's very clear to me that you bring a, a rich uh, arsenal with you of uh, 
experience and encouragement uh, from God's word. Beneath the cracks, all things work together for good. This comes from life experience. Yes. And I'm forgiven a celebration of God's love. Uh, both vital themes mm -hmm. to enjoying God's best. Mm -hmm. Yes. And like I said, uh, they, they've come from life experience. Sometimes life uh, treats us or kind of surprises us sometimes with turns that we didn't expect or plan for. And that's when you, I experienced the feeling of falling through a crack. It was not meant to happen. It's just out of imperfection that a crack exists in an institution or in a family system, even in a religious institution, in a church, in a workplace. Cracks happen and then you fall through. In most cases, one would say, it's daunting, I've fallen through, it's discouraging and going to self-pity. But beneath the crack was my testimony out of that uh, situation. When I fell down and there was a huge temptation to get bitter and to think of who or what to blame and to look back and say why or how it happened. But God spoke to me and said, you'll be wasting a lot of time thinking who to blame. There's so many people to blame, starting with yourself. <laughs> and then there'll be so many reasons why it should have been avoided or why it could not have happened. But there is another way to think through it. It's a testimony. It's an experience, a very valuable experience I've given you. Learn from it, grow from it, and use it as a ministry to touch other lives. And you refer to them as time out experiences. Time out. When you kind of go down into that crack, mm -hmm. and it's a wrestling match. It is. How are you going to yeah. deal with it? Yeah. What's your part mm -hmm. in moving beyond? And uh, and I say, how wonderful of God to just say, you know, you're going to waste a lot of time down yes. there if you're going to yes. stew and, and and deal with things you have no control over. No control over. And even the process of falling, I envision myself holding on to the slab almost kind of, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall. I have to hold on here. You see, if I fall, the whole plan is collapsed. I have planned for this, I've worked for this, I've envisioned this for so long, I can't afford to fall. But that's just wasting more and more time because the fall happens. The blessing is that what you expect to be a huge, difficult fall turns out to be a landing that was just in God's arms, an unexpected mm. landing. I was thinking I'll hit myself really hard on the slab, but no, I landed on something comfortable and cushioned me, and I was given a time out to stop and think, what next? Mm. You stumble, but you don't utterly fall, mm -hmm. as David mm -hmm. said. And I wonder if you could give us one illustration. Can you give us one example of this, one of the cracks from your life? The, the earliest crack in my life was when I, uh, my education was discontinued. My father could not afford to continue paying my school fees when I just, after my first term of high school. And that felt to me like a huge fall because in the context where I lived, and just at the time, without a secondary education, most children that fell through high school were given out for marriage at a very early age, or they lived a life of uh, house help, and abused, misused. Mm. So Just that was not a good place to, to fall. Get that was not a good place to be. But the Lord protected me in that. I did for one year house help, uh, like a live-in nanny, for one year, and I gave up that I will, the thought of ever going back to school. It took time, but by the time that happened, I had given my life to Jesus. I was already a committed Christian. Mm. However, I wondered why my Christianity and my prayers did not keep that from happening. I went to a youth group once and they were giving testimonies how miracles had happened. Someone said, I didn't have tuition and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then my uncle called and said, he'll pay. And I said, why is this not happening to me? Why is there no uncle calling or aunt calling or somebody happening? That is not how God had planned mine to happen. I didn't go back to school right away. It took a while. I was ministering in children's department in the church. I was just busy doing what uh, I could do in the church, waiting to know what will happen to me next. I don't belong. I felt an outsider when I'm among the youth because most of the youth were in high school or in college. But the Lord had planned my education differently. When he called me out, I got a, a teaching assistant job in the kindergarten and I went back to school in, as an independent student. And he called me to the ministry and gave me the education that I had so much wanted and longed for and cried for, but this time in his own way. And, and it worked time. Out. It worked <laughs> out for his, yeah, for good. So the, the experience down there in mm -hmm. the crack mm -hmm. uh, of disappointment, of Very, your failed yes. plans, mm -hmm. enriched you. It did. 
at the time, you don't see the enrichment. There is a tendency for bitterness. That was a difficult experience. Suicidal thoughts, wondering, rejection. Suicidal, that Suicidal desperate. thoughts. Because you belong in a group of people. When you are not in school, many, people, many children decide to drop out of school. Maybe it's a choice. Others, because the education system was such that you have to pass entry exam before you go to the next level. And if they don't make it, they cannot afford to continue through private uh, schools. So m many times, someone is associated with someone who has either refused to continue made the choice not to continue and that is when they are considered as maybe rebels and they are exposed to many things like people want to recruit you in uh, illegal activities yes. because you are available people and who are desperate yes and they think you're young and may not be a suspect in the eyes of the authorities mm -hmm. and so the temptation is high should i will i just draw back and fall into something because you're thinking does god care does he remember that i exist so there's that bitterness and the temptation to just draw back into self-pity and even into very illegal and harmful activities but by god's grace that did not happen mm -hmm. yeah we need to be reminded mm -hmm. how many of our brothers and sisters in sometimes in struggling countries value education yeah. how yeah. important it is to them now Having had this experience, you said this was the first crack. First crack, <laughs> not yeah. the last. Not the last. So, how does that epiphany really? Uh, you know, you've 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 seen that. Hey, God was with me in that, mm -hmm. and He was actually, as you say in your title, working good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me and for His glory ultimately mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in what He permitted. So, when the next crack comes, comes, you're falling. How do you? Does that change how you view that next disappointment or change in your plan? It changes to some extent. The surprising thing is that with one of the latest cracks, I told myself, hmm, I thought that by now I'll be prepared. Um, I know about this, I'm experienced, and it will come and I will say, I have seen it before, I've been there. But no, with each challenge, the challenge is for bigger growth and even a higher growth. And so with my latest falling through the crack experience, I, I, I got surprised. I surprised myself. I said, it shouldn't feel that bad. I've been there and I know God works things for good. It happens and you almost have the same feeling of this is it. This is the end. This is a huge fall. And I don't see a way out of this one. Because the more you grow, the more experience you get, and the, then the bigger the next falls are. That's how it felt with the latest fall. Mm. And there was also the tendency to say, this particular fall, I've been within an institution, a faith institution. So you don't expect it to happen. Yes. Because you're in a faith institution. People who- These are Christians. You believe in the same <laughs> Bible and you practice and there's justice in the church. And so there's the challenge to think and even have some negative, entertain some negative thoughts. Mm. And some God did not thinking. allow that to happen, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And even think revenge, no, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Mm. And we don't demand or get justice out of people, it's the Lord who works through the lives and hearts of people. And having experienced forgiveness before, and, and been forgiven by God, and God requires that, yes, extend that. You, you don't to take it to, to your... keep it, no. Hold extent. on to your peace and let the yes. Lord do the fighting mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. and that means waiting sometimes. And without that falling through the crack, the latest falling through the crack experience, I would not have uh, made the step towards cha hospital chaplaincy, which in the last two years have enriched my life in a very special way. As you yeah. enrich so many others. And that literally came out of yeah. another falling through the crack. Exactly. Bottom line, that you gotta trust God's gonna do. Exactly. David said, yeah. the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. He does, yeah, he does. If I didn't fall through the crack, I would not have considered and started looking at possibility of serving in the hospital. I didn't think that I could, even when I was younger and, and just possibility of serving in any capacity in medical health, I didn't think I could do that. But the Lord knew that I could. There was just the time had to be right <laughs> and experiences that prepare me for that. Yeah, yeah. And you just are more fully loaded for all the people you need to encourage in your ministry. Now, I'm forgiven, a, a celebration of God's love. This is a theme that we'll never wear out because it is so prevalent. It's a button that's being pushed all the time. You say in your book, uh, there is no record in the Bible 
of someone seeking forgiveness and God saying, nope, sorry, it's too <laughs> not <much>. forgiven. <laughs> your, your sin is too big. It's too big, there's no record. But mm -hmm. how, how much of an issue and has it affected you of having to forgive yourself, of having to come to the place no matter what you've done, where you see yourself as God sees you and you're truly starting in the confidence of that fresh beginning, that clean page. As a human being, many times we beat ourselves. I do, I beat myself too much more than God would. I almost want to assume that I'm in the role of God and I'm looking at myself and saying, shame, 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 we've been here before. <laughs> and not even what I can do to my own children. I will have grace, not that I will be that as good as God will be to them, but I would extend grace and yet, when it's me, I'm wondering, I don't know what God is thinking of me. At one time in my prayer, I was envisioning myself approaching the throne of grace. And I'm saying, but how do I approach the throne of grace when I have this scar on me? This, I've, I've been here, I've been there, and I've been stained. So you're coming to God so in I prayer. So I can't. And I envision an angel saying, just lift your head and speak to your father. And say, I can't, I'm ashamed. See what I've done, he said. Look beside you, who's standing beside you? And I can't even turn to look, I can't do that. And Jesus is standing beside you, and the stain is in your mind. It's not even there, because he has clothed you with his righteousness. It, mm -hmm. It's not forgiving myself that keeps me longer in that period of, of repentance. I, I don't know how much, because I feel like I've just said I'm sorry. Is that enough? <laughs> Maybe something else needs to happen. I need to suffer for this. And that is not how God thinks. That's how we think as human beings. Mm. He wants you to get up and get on with and it. Move on. Yes. It was paid for 2,000 years ago. It was a surprise when uh, our missionary wife came looking for me. One week he said, I was in church and the Lord spoke to me and said, my child, I've forgiven you, but you have not forgiven yourself. And he brought your image to my mind. And she came looking for me during the week. I was even trying to keep away and hide. He said, the Lord says, yes, I don't know what it is, but he has forgiven you. Mm -hmm. The only problem, what's keeping you back is that you have not forgiven yourself. So you Jeez. want to learn to do that. We're sons of Adam, we're hiding in the bushes. We need to yeah. come on, get on with it. Look at this beautiful family. We have a picture first of, what's your husband's name? Francis. Francis. Everyone is F And Florence, I love it. And uh, oh, so good that the family was able in, in, in pieces to come, but all together now. And your beautiful daughters today Look at this. That's a quiver. That's mm -hmm. an official quiver. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Five daughters. Five daughters. Mm -hmm. So blessed. And the hospitals where you serve, where people might see you in this area, tell us what they are, Florence. The Grand River Hospital is in uh, Kitchener, Waterloo. There are actually two sites, the KW site and the Freeport site. And Cambridge Memorial Hospital is in Cambridge, as the name says. Those ministries have enriched my life. I, I go to, into a ward to minister to a patient and God is there mm -hmm. and God has prepared them and they minister to me just by sometimes sitting in the presence of a patient and they tell you something that touches your life. Just my latest ministry, a patient was just extending love and asking for a hug. They say, they see how God has touched their life and led them along. And there's just that connection. Sometimes a patient is from a different Christian tradition. Yes. But we connect in mm. God. We connect in Jesus. We connect with the fundamental of what Jesus has done. Jesus, yeah. the great connector. We are of different traditions, different backgrounds, but we connect. And Florence, just in case someone watching today is beating themselves up instead of getting on, receiving that forgiveness, uh, we started talking about snow right off the top of the program beauty of fresh fallen slow, snow. Isaiah 118. God says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 